Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. Listen now for the word of God. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. O Lord, uphold me, that I may uplift thee. Amen. Well, leave it to Mark to spoil the Easter party again. Cecilia read the grammatically correct version, but a more accurate translation from the Greek is, the women fled the tomb and said nothing to nobody, for they were afraid. The end. Game over. Gospel done. And what a terrible ending to the story, so terrible that as some of you know, later church folks tried to write a couple of fairy tale endings that aren't part of the original. And honestly, I don't blame them. If anything, they didn't go far enough. If you're going to make stuff up to soften the message, I'd start with the crucifixion itself. That They took him to the place called Golgotha, and just as they were about to drive the nails in his palms, lightning bolts rained down from heaven, and with the strength of 40 men, he rose from the cross with the cry, Not today, Caesar. <laughs> That's the way I would have rewritten the story. Unfortunately, Mark very much intended the ending that we get. In it, the people who are closest to Jesus abandon him altogether. Judas betrays him. Peter denies him. All of them, Mark says, deserted him and fled. We can't say that we didn't see it coming. The women might be the ones who are terrified in this text, but the men have shown their pitiful fear and ignorance all through the entirety of this gospel story. Way back in chapter 4, Jesus explains that only those with faith can understand the parables, and right then, the disciples ask for explanation. In the same chapter, Jesus chastises them for their fear, which he says is rooted in their lack of faith, and they respond by fearing even more and asking, who is this? Midway through the gospel, he tells those dimwits three different times that he's going to die, and in response, Peter rebukes him, the disciples argue over who is the greatest, and James and John ask to sit on his right and his left when he comes into his kingdom. Slow learners. So when Judas finally betrays him and Peter denies him and they all desert him to the cross, we can't say that we didn't see it all coming. It's the women who surprise us in Mark. A lot of us had expected them to be the heroines of this text as they are in the other Gospels, the real disciples who show us what true discipleship is all about. 
And yet Mary and Mary and Salome watch the crucifixion from a distance, and they don't show up Easter morning ready to meet the risen Christ. They show up to anoint a body. They think Jesus is dead. They assume that Jesus is dead, and when they do hear the Easter morning proclamation from some random young man in a white robe telling them that Jesus has gone ahead of them to Galilee, they fail in the first Easter morning assignment, fleeing the tomb, saying nothing to nobody. Mark seems like someone who would describe himself as a spiritual but not religious person way before that became kind of a thing. One of those I'd follow Christ if not for all the Christians kind of people who nearly predicted just how terrible Jesus' followers can be. I mean, from the time when Mark wrote this book in the first century, we've had so many examples of people who call themselves Christians doing unchrist like things that it's hard to know which examples to choose from. Guns in the name of Jesus, fascism in the name of Jesus, violently storming government buildings in the name of Jesus, political candidates who have never read Bible selling them in the name of Jesus. <laughs> just to name a few recent examples. So many examples of Christians who have gone off the rails, forsaken the core message of loving your neighbor as yourself, of healing the vulnerable, not shaming them, of forgiving sinners, not getting revenge with them, of welcoming outsiders, not making it more difficult for them to join the community and call it home. Mark's gospel saw it all coming. The book is called The Good News of Jesus Christ. Seems to me it would be better titled The Betrayal of the Good News of Jesus Christ. Mark is a realist, as real as they come. Jesus' message is so radically countercultural, Mark suggests, that it is going to be near impossible for anyone to wholeheartedly embrace. Turn the other cheek. Let go of all your fear, give away all of your money and possessions, lay down all of your anxiety, hold fast to what is good in the presence of violence in this world. Wow. Good luck with that. Mark knows from the very beginning that the way of Christ is near impossible to embrace, near impossible to enact. The community of Christians doing what Christ commands all the time is nearly impossible to realize. What's more, the gospel message itself is near impossible to believe. God's self incarnated in a particular Jewish kid from Galilee in a particular year in history who's put to death by the state and raised to life three whole days later? Mark knows this is very difficult for us to believe, and unlike the other three gospel stories, Mark doesn't even give us any resurrection appearances to make it more believable. You know, no resurrected Jesus mistaken for the gardener or walking through closed doors like you get in John's gospel. No mystical Jesus showing up breaking bread with grieving disciples on their road to Emmaus like in Luke's gospel. No earthquakes and dazzling angel like in Matthew's gospel, just the temple curtain torn in two and a young man in a white robe sitting in an empty tomb proclaiming that Jesus has been raised without any special effects or even brass or timpani to back it up. No wonder the early church tacked on addendums. Mark seems to be the quintessential realist, realistic about the fact that disciples like us are asked to believe and do some near impossible things while receiving few miracles, angels, or mystical special effects in our lives. Only proclamation from some random young man that Jesus is risen. Mark is aware that even Jesus' closest disciples, upon hearing that good news, are likely to say nothing to nobody. 
Now, maybe that's terrible news to those of you who have shown up this morning, you know, expecting the preacher can, like a magician, pull some comforting assurances out of my homiletical hat to prove to you that love wins, that weapons lose, that grief ends, and peace reigns. You know, but given where we are in the world today, I'll take Mark's realism over fake fairy tale endings that depend on Jesus' followers being better than we actually are. Because we are likely to fail at what Jesus has called us to be and to do. We, we actually have failed. We have failed at bringing people together across race and ethnicity, across nationality, creed, and clan. We have failed at being peacemakers. The world has been constantly at war for most of my life. We have failed at welcoming those considered outsiders. Jesus said, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone, and yet that hasn't stopped Christians from throwing rocks at queer people or people on the other side of the political aisle or just people on the finance committee. And yet, unlike many of us who have witnessed that failure in others or felt the shame of knowing it in ourselves, Mark is not a pessimist. The story is not over for Mark. And I don't just mean the way he ends it with the women fleeing in fear. I mean, Mark's very brief gospel leaves a lot of stuff unwritten that we have come to expect based on our knowledge of the other three. There's no long extended forgiveness session with Peter, no feasting with the disciples to balance out the Last Supper, no commissioning to send them off with the power to baptize all nations, no breathing on them to bring them a peace to set their anxious minds at ease, and my favorite, no gory death of Judas. He gets to keep his bowels fully intact. (laughs) The story is not over for Mark. Every single one of these disciples can write their own beginning from here. Now, based on everything that I've told you to this point, that is still not great news. If the disciples are told to go back to Galilee, Galilee, never mind, where everything started, Why in the world would we think that they have a better chance of sticking to Jesus' message and mission any better than the first time around? And why would we think that we could do any better than them? Especially what we've seen from the church in recent years. Especially given the failures we have experienced in ourselves and in each other. The answer is very easy to miss in Mark's gospel. I've missed it every year of my life until this one. Like a lot of Mark's readers, I've thought that Mark's gospel is primarily a warning that discipleship, that following Jesus is costly. It requires total commitment, and it is and it does. The community is charged with getting Jesus' welcome right. The community has to get Jesus' non-judgmental stance right. We have to get the priorities of our pocketbooks correct. But somehow along the way, I interpreted that exacting message to mean that there is no place for mistakes with this gospel. Taking up your cross means being better than all of Jesus' followers in Mark. There is no place for imperfection. And if there's no place for imperfection, then I'm sorry, but we have nothing good to offer to our culture. Because we are already living in a world that demands unrealistic perfection from each other. That's why we have a public culture of people who either lie about their own faults and failures, becoming hypocrites in the process, or are so afraid of saying or doing or being the wrong thing that they've given up on trying to be good at all. 
They've given up on trying to do anything good that might put them at risk of being criticized. That's why life for so many people has turned into managing brands of ourselves instead of becoming more fully our true God-given selves. Mark's gospel is not a gospel of perfection, but rather it is a gospel of second chances. The young man in the tomb helped me see that. I always thought, that it was kind of weird that Mark's gospel has a random young man in a white robe who delivers the Easter morning proclamation when all the other gospels have something a lot more spectacular. Earthquakes, angels, even Jesus himself. What is so special about a young man who's dressed for the sauna at the local gym? But this year I discovered a young man two chapters back. When Judas betrays Jesus and everyone deserted him, you might have heard it if you were here on Friday night. A certain young man, the text says, was following him wearing nothing but a linen cloth. That's weird too, but it gets even weirder. They caught hold of him, the text says, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. Now, at first, I thought this was just the Markin first century equivalent of clickbait. Gratuitous nudity to sell the story. But it's not. Here we have the last person who deserted Jesus and is ashamed for it. What nakedness often means in Scripture. And this defeated shamed person becomes the first proclaimer of good news. This doesn't make him a hero. It just proves what Brian Stevenson wrote in his book, Just Mercy. Each of us is more than the worst thing we have ever done. God's love for you, it can make all things new, which means that every person who deserted Jesus in Mark's gospel Even Judas can become a proclaimer of good news. And my, we are desperate. We are desperate for good news. The aftermath of this whole bridge catastrophe this week has taught me that, of course, we all pray for the families of those who lost their lives in this horrific event. And thank God for those public servants who saved many more lives by doing their jobs when it really counted. You never know when you're going to save somebody's life just by doing your job. Alongside all of that, my, we are obsessed with people and things that get knocked down, destroyed, bombed, shot, killed, hurt, obliterated. We watch those kinds of videos over and over again. It's why political candidates who create chaos, say and do terrible things, get way more publicity than those who are trying to build things up. And you could blame it on the media where bad news far outweighs good news by as much as 17 negative news reports for every one. Or you could blame it on social networks where algorithms tend to feed us more negative, anger-filled stories than positive ones. Or you could just blame it on our brains that we know from research are more like Velcro for negative news and Teflon for good. Whatever the reason, God calls us to proclaim the good news of God's justice, which is the good news of God's mercy that enables flawed, fallible people like me and like you to recover from our shame, to be healed from all the times when we chose fear instead of love or chose to attack instead of extend grace, missing out on receiving it ourselves to move through our past failures, our fear of others, our choices of personal safety over communal well-being, so that we can announce to other scared and tired people 
that life and love and hope is alive and present and available to us all. And sure, I'll grant you that your tiny little proclamation probably feels incredibly small and insignificant next to ocean liner-sized forces of bad news that can snuff out lives from Gaza to Ukraine to the Chesapeake Bay. But don't you leave here after hearing good news and say nothing to nobody. Because good news that is proclaimed always makes a difference. One person who says something good to somebody with their words or their deeds. I heard this story of a substitute teacher who was sent to visit a little boy in the hospital. His class had been working on nouns and adverbs, and so the teacher went there to make sure that he didn't fall behind. But when this teacher arrived at the hospital, she was alarmed to discover that the child was in the hospital's burn unit, in critical condition and in a tremendous amount of pain. She felt awkward intruding on his recovery with something that seemed so senseless as grammar, but she stumbled through the lesson anyway. The next morning, the nurse on the burn unit said to the teacher, what did you do to that boy yesterday? And before the teacher could get out her apology, the nurse said, we had given up on him. But ever since you visited him, he seems to be fighting back, responding to treatment. The boy himself later shared that he had given up hope, but it all changed when he concluded that they wouldn't send a teacher to work on nouns and adverbs with a dying boy, would they? Good news that is proclaimed always makes a difference. If that weren't true, then none of us would be here this morning. All it took was one unnamed young person to move through the shame of his own failure in order to birth a church and gift us with hope and possibility to share with each other in the world. Somebody said something to somebody and it made all the difference. 